Welcome to Electron Online, and now we're going to look at the third of four Maxwell's equations. In this case, we're going to look at what we call Faraday's Law of Induction. This will, again, enhance our ability to understand Maxwell's equations, and of course, we're doing that in the integral form. At some later videos, we'll take a look at the differential form of Maxwell's equations, but here we're going to do the integral form of Maxwell's equations. So, where we can understand the Faraday's laws of induction is by taking a conductor and, and make it into a shape of a circle. So, here we have a circular or loop conductor. The radius, 0.4 meters, and let's put a magnetic field through the conductor, and for the sake of this example, let's say that the magnetic field strength is 2 teslas and is directed in a positive y direction where the loop is simply in such is fashioned in such a way that the plane of the loop is parallel to the direction or I should say not the plane but the perpendicular to the plane is parallel to the B field. So you can see that the B field is simply perpendicular to the plane made by the loop. Now if the B field is continuous and the B field is not changing then nothing will happen in the loop. There simply will be a B field and nothing special will happen in the loop. There's no current flowing through the loop. There's no potential difference or ENF, uh, EMF across the loop or anything like that. But once the field begins to change, for some reason, if the field increases or decreases in such a way that the magnetic flux through the loop changes, then something begins to happen. And that's the concept of Faraday's law. Faraday's law said that if the magnetic field through the loop, or with other words, the magnetic flux through the loop changes, that will cause an ENF to be induced. And then Lenz's law then says, well, that induced EMF will then cause a current to exist in the loop, which will then set up a magnetic field trying to oppose the change of the field that was there in the first place, trying to oppose the whole operation, trying to oppose what the field was doing in the first place, changing. All right. So, Let's first go to an old example of how we can calculate the potential difference across, let's say, two capacitor plates where there exists an electric field in between. So here I try to draw that as an example. Let's say we have two capacitor plates. Let's say that there's an electric field that exists from, that emanates from left to right, and that would be what you'd expect because there's positive charge on this side, negative charge on this side, so we expect to have a uniform electric field between the two capacitor plates. If we now take a test charge, a small positive charge called Q, and we push it all the way across from the negative side of, from the negative plate to the positive plate, we would have to do a certain amount of work. That work will equal to the force times the distance, and the force experienced by the small test charge inside the electric field E would equal E times Q. That's by definition. And of course, we take the force E times Q multiplied times the distance traveled D. That will then be the work done to get that small charge from this side to the other side right there. If we now divide the work done by the test charge Q, that's the same as saying EQD divided by Q, and by definition, the work done to move the charge from there to there divided by Q equals the potential difference between the two plates, and I indicate that by V, which is the voltage between the two plates, which is therefore equal to E times D since the Qs cancel out, and that is then known as the potential difference between the plates. It can also be assumed to be the EMF between the plates, the electromotive force and the reason why they called voltage or potential difference electromotive force because it appeared as if whenever there existed a potential difference between two locations, there was this apparent force trying to drive charges from one side to the other, from one potential to the other. And so if it was a higher potential here, low potential there, a positive charge would be pushed in the direction from higher to lower potential. If there was a higher potential here, lower potential there, a negative charge would be pushed from the lower potential to the higher potential. So that was understood to be the potential difference, and that was understood as also to be the EMF, the electromotive force seeming to drive charges from high to low, from low to high, depending upon whether or not they're positive or negative. So keeping that in mind, now let's go back to what we call Faraday's law of induction. Now, the magnetic field changes. As the magnetic field changes, let's say, for example, that the change in the magnetic field is equal to of minus 0.1 tesla per second. That will then cause the magnetic flux through the loop to change, which will therefore, based on Faraday's law, cause an ENF to be induced. And the surface, not the surface integral, but the line integral of E dot dS is then equal to minus the change in the magnetic flux over time. Now, if you don't remember what the magnetic flux is, the magnetic flux, in this case, 
would be equal to the magnetic field strength B times the area of the loop A. So in this case, that would be equal to B times the area would be pi times the radius squared. And since we have given you these specific amounts here, you can say in this case that would be two Teslas times pi times 0 0.4 meters squared. And that would be the magnetic flux through the loop. And of course, as the magnetic field strength is decreasing by 0.1 Teslas per second, we can expect the, the flux, the magnetic flux of the loop to decrease in the same ratio. This looks like it's about 120th or about 5% per second. So the magnetic field will lose its strength 5% every second. So that would happen over a period of about 20 seconds. The same would happen to the magnetic flux. It would decrease at a rate of 5% per second and it would go from this amount to zero in 20 seconds, just like the magnetic field. While that is happening during those 20 seconds, while the B field is changing, while the magnetic flux is decreasing, that would cause an electric field to exist along the loop and if we take the strength of the electric field and multiply it times the circumference because that's where the line integral is we can assume since the distance since the the loop is perfectly symmetrical all the way around it's a circular loop the b field is is uniform throughout the loop we can expect the strength of the electric field to be the same everywhere along the loop of course the, the direction of the electric field of course will change it'll be parallel to the to the current loop all the way around and if we then multiply that times the entire circumference e times the entire circumference 2 pi r would equal the line integral of e dot ds so what we can say then is we can say that the strength of the e field along the loop times the circumference 2 pi r that is equal to minus the change in the magnetic flux over time now what does e dot 2 pi r it's the strength of the electric field times the distance of that path. That sounds an awful lot like what we just did over here because here the electric field is uniform and over here along this current loop we can say the electric field is uniform as well. It's the same at least in magnitude. Of course it changes constantly in direction but that's okay because anywhere we go along the loop the E will always point in the same direction as the ds and so therefore the angle between them is zero and so E dot ds if we want to write it like this E dot ds is equal to the magnitude of v times the magnitude of ds times the cosine of the angle between them but you can see that the angle between the two is always zero all the way around and the cosine of zero is one so in this case we could say that's equal to e times the ds and that of course that would be a small uh, infinitesimal small section of this whole circumference if we then integrate it all the way around we can then say that this integrated is equal to e times the complete circumference 2 pi r which is what we write over there which is equal to minus the ddt of the flux magnetic flux now if the strength of the field doesn't change and you multiply it times 2 pi r that's the exact same thing as saying the strength of the field times the distance traveled which means that this has to be equal to the potential difference which means that because of the change in the magnetic flux it is as if there is a potential difference across this loop. It is as if we added a battery on this loop. And the strength of the battery, the potential difference of that battery, would be equal to the EMF induced, which in this case is equal to E dot 2 pi r. That will then be the EMF minus the change in the magnetic flux over time. And so the strength of that EMS, the amount of that voltage, the amount of that potential difference, there is of course no real battery there, but it acts as if there's a real battery there causing the current to flow around. Now, if the electric field is going in this direction, that means that's higher, that's higher potential here, lower potential there. So in essence, I guess I should have drawn the battery this way, where the positive side of the battery is here, the negative side of the battery is there, so that we have the direction of the change in potential in that direction. But now, can we figure out how big that is? Yes, we can. We just need to know what this change in the, the flux is. And of course, since the flux is equal to this, and it changes by 5% of this every second, we can therefore say that this is equal to uh, 0 0.05, which is 5% of the total amount that it started with. So 5% of two, that's two Teslas, times pi times 0 0.4 squared. And of course, that would be meters squared. So Tesla's meters squared 
and times 5%, and let's see what that would be equal to. Now, where, what about the negative? Well, we can still put the negative there. It just simply means that the, it's simply a reactionary thing to the change in the magnetic flux. That's why the, the negative is there. It's kind of like the same thing with the spring constant. The force is equal to minus kx. That's because it's a reactionary force. EMF induces a reactionary event to the change in the, in the magnetic flux. That's why the negative is there. All right, so 0 0.05 times 2 times pi times 0.4 squared equals, and it looks like that would therefore induce an EMF of voltage equal to 0 0.05 volts. So by allowing the magnetic field to change at a rate of 5% per second over a period of 20 seconds from 2 tesla down to 0, changing the magnetic flux to the loop, you will for those 20 seconds induce an EMF of 0 0.05 volts, which will then cause a current to flow through the loop. And now let's take a look at that real quick. So then you would have a current flying, flowing through the loop like this, which will then set up its own magnetic field, which will oppose the change. Now that's Lenz's law. And what you can then do is look at this. If there's a, a current going through the loop like this, use your right hand rule. If the current goes around like this, your thumb will then point in the direction of the B field produced by this induced current. So now you'll have a B field, which will be in the same direction as the original field, because this current will produce a B field that will try to oppose the change. What is the change? A reduction in the strength of the field. And opposition to the reduction strength of the field is adding additional B field to try and keep it from reducing. Of course, that's only a temporary thing. Eventually, the B field will always go to zero, but at least induced current, which is a product of the induced EMF, which is a product of the induced electric field around the loop like that, will therefore exist and set up a B field that will try to pose the change in the first place. Wow. So hopefully that all made sense. And that is the concept and the understanding from Faraday's law that a changing magnetic field inside a current loop will indeed set up an electric field along that current loop, which will therefore induce an EMF, which will therefore cause a current to flow through the loop, which therefore will set up a B field that will try to pose the change in the original B field in the first place. And that is the understanding of the third equation of Maxwell, which is also known as Faraday's law of induction.